Right, we're standing now here at this uh, small stream. The bridge is out. The bridge is taken away, you know? Oh wow. The bridge is uh, under the earth. <laughs> They're uh, fixing uh, the walls over here and probably we can manage to get the bikes over. The bikes are over there. Okay, we weren't supposed to pass, but this uh, gentleman helped us across the bridge and uh, we have to be quick because his bus is coming very soon and if we move before his bus is here, then uh, he gets into no trouble. <laughs> okay, thank you, bye-bye. So we're now on this other road up. The Senegalese gentleman that helped us talked to this local and he said the road up ahead was blocked as well. We're now on this other road and they said it's supposed to be easy going from here. So, let's go. We're almost in France, just around 400 meters, I guess. Then we will cross the border into France for about a month or more. So uh, yeah, excited to see what France has to offer. There's a lot of rain in the forecast for this afternoon, so we have to make some kilometers before it will hit. So let's do it. It's Maori running back to the camera. He's nice and easy, relaxed. <laughs> That's beautiful. You are so delicious. Or he's kissing me. That's it. Good morning, miss. That is typical Eric. No breakfast, no coffee. I'm cold, I'm hungry. My feet are wet because of the grass. And then he flogged me. <laughs> that sounds kinky. <laughs> hey, good morning everybody. Man, what a morning it was. So cold and wet in the tent. And you feel really uncomfortable. Uh, that way but it's a great balance when the sun comes up like this and you get warm again uh, for me in that moment there's the magic of life the contrast between being uncomfortable and getting comfortable again feeling alive that that's that that window oh man it's great and uh, it's supposed to be a really promising day with beautiful weather and man I'm so looking forward to it we're back in the mountains again and this is really where we want to be. Been looking forward to it the whole trip already. And uh, we're gonna take you with us and uh, let's enjoy. Hi guys, I'm now here at the laundromat in France. We are staying in an Airbnb to edit our videos and we have to do some laundry, but I also have to uh, wash my sleeping bag. I bought some special detergent for down sleeping bags and I also bought some tennis balls uh, for the drying process to kind of loft up the down again. Now it's all compressed the down and it doesn't have any insulation power anymore and because it's getting colder and colder I really need to fix that before we head into the mountains of France. So let's do it! Something is going wrong because I put in like 10 euros, I get back three and now it says zero. What about it? Ah, I can just probably start using one of the machines now. 
blonde. That's my hair color. So I have to be honest, it's pretty scary to wash my down sleeping bag like this. This sleeping bag is quite dear to me because it kept me warm in most circumstances. So I really hope I did it well. <laughs> Normal clothes are done, so I'm gonna put those in the dryer and now it's waiting for my sleeping bag. So at the moment of truth, I'm gonna get out the sleeping bag from the washing machine. We'll put it there in the dryer. So it's a few hours later now, I'm sitting here outside of the laundromat. Yeah, I just checked the sleeping bag, it's coming along nicely. It puffed up quite a bit, so I just gave it an extra 20 minutes and hopefully then it's done. Because I'm here all day already, so I'm ready to get back to Eric and enjoy the evening. Alright, I'm back on the bike and uh, man, it was a long day. It felt super fluffy and puffed up, so uh, that's really, really good news. Happy sleeping bag, happy me and uh, a successful mission, I would say. Well, not that successful. The good thing is it didn't get worse, but the bad thing, it didn't improve. There are still lumps of down clumped together and spots without any insulation. I will probably have to bring it to a professional cleaner later in our trip. Anyways, back to me. I mean, yeah, back to the video. You know what I mean. So let's get back home and have some dinner. So we're here at our Airbnb and as you can see behind me it's just an amazing place. Thoroughly enjoying himself. The family that we're here with, they have a partly self-sustaining farm. So behind me, they have a big vegetable garden and they also have chickens for their eggs. They slaughter their own meat as well. And although we're vegetarian, we think it's a better way than to buy it in the supermarket. So it's pretty inspiring to see how they all manage this. And uh, we did some uh, editing of the videos. We did some chores that you have to do while you're on the bicycle, like charging your electronics, washing and stuff. So. Uh, we're all prepared again and tomorrow we will hop back on the bike, so we will see you there. Hey, good morning. We are now on our way to the Unité de Habichon. That's a very important building built by Le Corbusier. Um, this is the one in Brie. The really famous one is in Marseille. And I visited that one in my 20s. And it's super nice to get reacquainted with the building again. I was highly impressed by it and I will show you the building and tell you a little something about it. We're now here at the Unité de Habichon at Brie, built by the famous architect Le Corbusier, arguably one of the most famous architects that ever lived. As a young guy, around 18, with a friend, I went road tripping around France to see all buildings of Le Corbusier. And uh, in that time, I studied architecture and wanting to become an architect. And this is one of the buildings that inspired me most. This building is a very important building in architectural history because it's a front runner of the modernist movement around the 50s. It strives to build housing on a social level for the lower class income to give the people the best housing they could have for what they could afford. Another thing that's really interesting to note is that the furniture inside the building, some of them is specially designed for this building and things like the kitchen uh, are so famous that a lot of big museums around the world they have the kitchen rebuilt as a part of their exhibition. 
This building is also instrumental for the brutalist movement that followed, building these very large concrete building blocks in big cities all over the world. And these are, in my opinion, not the best examples of housing uh, for people. A lot of them became ghettos in the end. I think it's a very inspiring building and I hope that architects now and in the future will take inspiration from these types of buildings to build better housing for people because in my belief nowadays a lot of housing is done very cheaply, very poorly. It's about the interaction that people have with their, their environment, the built environment, but also the natural environment and the spaces in between. And I think this building is really instrumental in that. So how do you like this building? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> It's like a, a regular flat, I would say. I especially like the story about it, but I wouldn't say it's very interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> At least she's honest about it. Uh, for me, it's beautiful because uh, I have a history with my architectural studies, and but I can imagine that for somebody seeing it for the first time, it's just a, like a concrete building with some uh, nice colors. <laughs> and uh, nothing very special. It does remind me of those paintings from Mondrian or something. Yeah, it does. I think it's actually inspired by that kind of cubist mm -hmm. kind of movement from, uh, from back then yeah. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, cool stuff. Where are we going next? <laughs> I'm not sure. To the Muzzle. To the rivers again. Yeah. All right. Okay.